Hello everyone, I've done the introduction in the second part of this video, um, but what we'll do is go through Luke's Gospel now. Um, I recorded the second part after this video first, so it's a bit wonky, um, but this is the video that I've actually found now for Luke's Gospel. So enjoy the video and then we'll do the proper formal introduction after this video and uh, lead it on into the study of Luke's Gospel. Many have undertaken to draw up an account of the things that have been fulfilled among us. Just as they were handed down to us by those who from the first were eyewitnesses and servants of the word. With this in mind, since I myself have carefully investigated everything from the beginning, I too decided to write an orderly account for you, most excellent Theophilus, so that you may know the certainty of the things you have been taught. In the time of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah, who belonged to the priestly division of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth was also a descendant of Aaron. Both of them were righteous in the sight of God, observing all the Lord's commands and decrees blamelessly. But they were childless, because Elizabeth was not able to conceive, and they were both very old. Once, when Zechariah's division was on duty, and he was serving as priest before God, he was chosen by lot according to the custom of the priesthood, to go into the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And when the time for the burning of incense came, all the assembled worshippers were praying outside. <laughs> then an angel of the Lord appeared to him standing at the right side of the altar of incense. When Zechariah saw him, he was startled and was gripped with fear. But the angel said to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah. Your prayer has been heard. Your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you are to call him John. He will be a joy and delight to you, and many will rejoice because of his birth for he will be great in the sight of the Lord. He is never to take wine or other fermented drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit even before he is born. He will bring back many of the people of Israel to the Lord their God, and he will go on before the Lord in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the parents to their children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the righteous to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Zechariah asked the angel, how can I be sure of this? I am an old man and my wife is well along in years. The angel said to him, I am Gabriel. I stand in the presence of God and I have been sent to speak to you and to tell you this good news. And now you will be silent and not able to speak until the day this happens, because you did not believe my words, which will come true at their appointed time. Meanwhile, the people were waiting for Zechariah and wondering why he stayed so long in the temple. When he came out, he could not speak to them. 
They realized he had seen a vision in the temple, for he kept making signs to them, but remained unable to speak. When his time of service was completed, he returned home. After this, his wife Elizabeth became pregnant and for five months remained in seclusion. The Lord has done this for me, she said. In these days, he has shown his favor and taken away my disgrace among the people. In the sixth month of Elizabeth's pregnancy, God sent the angel Gabriel to Nazareth, a town in Galilee, to a virgin pledged to be married to a man named Joseph, a descendant of David. <laughs> the virgin's name was Mary. The angel went to her and said, Greetings, you who are highly favored. The Lord is with you. Mary was greatly troubled at his words and wondered what kind of greeting this might be. But the angel said to her, Do not be afraid, Mary. You have found favor with God. You will conceive and give birth to a son, and you are to call him Jesus. He will be great and will be called the Son of the Most High. The Lord God will give him the throne of his father, David, and he will reign over Jacob's descendants forever. His kingdom will never end. How will this be? Mary asked the angel, since I am a virgin. The angel answered, the Holy Spirit will come on you and the power of the Most High will overshadow you. So the Holy One to be born will be called the Son of God. Even Elizabeth, your relative, is going to have a child in her old age. And she who was said to be unable to conceive is in her sixth month. For no word from God will ever fail. I am the Lord's servant, Mary answered. May your word to me be fulfilled. Then the angel left her. Hello everyone, welcome to the Luke series. So this is going to be going through the Gospel according to Luke. Um, yeah, we've just done John, it was really, really exciting. I hope you guys enjoyed it. Um, if you're new to the channel, then this is pretty much a commentary. Um, so this kind of thumbnail that you've clicked on hopefully will be blue. Um, it'll be going through Luke's Gospel chapter by chapter. Um, some of the longer chapters will split into two sections and hopefully each video will be about 30 minutes. And it will be going through, yeah, how amazing it is, how amazing the Gospel is, how amazing the Bible is. And um, it's all about Jesus. So uh, let's let's just jump right in. So the overview of Luke is uh, it is written by you guessed it. It's written by Luke, um, and he was a Syrian from Antioch. Uh, with this piece of information, we can deduce that Luke was probably not Jewish as well. He's probably a Gentile. Um, Luke was also a doctor and chronologically listed what Jesus did in his life. So he carefully observed pretty much everything. He was one of those guys. Acts is the second book he wrote, which documents the life. Um, of the disciples after Jesus' death. So this is the book he wrote before Jesus' death, and then the Acts is the book he wrote afterwards. And he compiled this book probably around 30 years after Jesus died. Now that's a bit contested, but um, it's a probably around about 30 years after Jesus died. So in terms of historical accuracy, it is extremely close to the events that he's documenting. There is wide acceptance of other historical accounts of other people that are hundreds of years after they were supposed to have happened and uh, a lot of people find it very easy to accept those as historically accurate but of course we have an enemy we have satan who will always try and uh, convince people this is false when really it's got an avalanche of data and uh, avalanche of evidence that it is definitely a real historical account same with matthew mark um, and john so yeah 30 years after jesus died so yeah extremely 
quickly afterwards. So let's just let's dive straight into verse one. So this is the sort of one to four, the very first bit. It's titled in my Bible, The Dedication to Theophilus, I think is how you pronounce it. So who is Theophilus? He was, he was probably a high-ranking official that converted to Christianity. He probably was asking Luke about the events of Jesus' life. So Luke then sort of felt compelled to write everything that he knew, compiled and researched about Jesus. And Luke was not part of the 12 disciples, but probably had a very close relationship with them in order to compile this account. And he had a very close relationship with Paul as well. So he was sort of there. He could have been not part of the 12 disciples, but he could have been a follower of Jesus at the time. Um, but he is one of those guys that's very analytical, very smart, very organised, very put together. A doctor who uh, was a very keen writer. So he then then becomes a Christian after that and wanted proper eyewitness evidence compiled into a nice chronological order so that more people would come to faith perhaps by evidence and study so like I said he's one of those guys that is um, a bit like Lee Strobel who studies the Bible and needs uh, data and evidence and he's a very analytical person so we can trust this account is going to be very organised and very rigid and uh, incredibly accurate which is fantastic that's why I think uh, the Lord led me to go through Luke because John is a very amazingly in-depth discipleship actual uh, eyewitness account but Luke is sort of eyewitnesses compiled together and very yeah strong in its research so verses one to four this is just simply Luke describing to Theophilus why this book is accurate and why he wanted to write it the main reason is for Theophilus to read it uh, read it through and have assurance that this man Jesus was actually in fact who he said he was so I imagine Theophilus was probably thinking, OK, yeah, no, I'm definitely a Christian now, but I'd love to know more. I'd love to know more evidence that I can tell other um, Greeks and other officials about this because they're coming at me saying, you know, where's the evidence? And what a great thing to do for us. It may have not been what he was like, but I think it probably was. That's why Luke decided to write it to him. And we should be like that as well. We should have people asking us, you know, where's the facts then? Where's the evidence for this? And we should be able to reel off and even ask people. Theophilus probably asked Luke, can you write me a, a detailed account as to what happened? I want to know. And uh, it's inspiring. And we should we should be like that as well. So that's verses 1 to 4. Um, that you may have certainty concerning things that have been taught to you. So it's probably a little bit, you know, I'm not exactly sure. And Luke was like, no, no, I'll, I'll tell you. I'll compile this. I'll gather the evidence and we'll go through it. So verses 5 to 10, so this is when we kind of go back a bit. So Luke focuses now on John the Baptist and the birth of John the Baptist being foretold. And this is really interesting. I haven't really studied this in any great detail but until today, and it was really, really interesting. So we jump right into the beginning of the account of Jesus' life. It starts off by Luke describing the birth of John the Baptist. We know that John prepares the way for Jesus' ministry, almost like a prequel to Jesus. So as you can see, Luke really starts from the very, very beginning fleshing out the full historical backstory of the ministry of Jesus. And John the Baptist is paramount in that ministry because he kind of um, tills the ground ready for Jesus coming. He points people and says, that is him, that's definitely him. And uh, this amazing supernatural event which we're about to hear about now is uh, more evidence as to how supernatural this is, how God-given this birth of Jesus is going to be. So we now hear about John's father, uh, Zechariah. He was a priest among about 20,000 in that time. So there had been about 20,000 priests. This is before, obviously, Jesus was born. This is before John the Baptist was born. This is John the Baptist's dad, basically. Um, so he, would, he was amongst 20,000 priests. He was then chosen to enter the holy place to burn incense. And this was a massive deal, probably the most important event in his lifetime. He was a priest. He was waking up every morning, going to this kind of service where hundreds of people would have been. There would have been 20,000 priests, or around about that number, chosen at random um, each day to go into the Holy of Holies and light some, uh, give a burnt offering, so light some incense. And he was chosen, he was picked, one in 20,000 chance. He was the one selected to enter that holy place, kind of almost lead the service, um, pray before, go in, light, pray afterwards. He was the one chosen. So he's probably full of anticipation, very nervous, thinking, oh, you know, what did you say? Asking the other priests, what did you say? You know, how do I, I know what to pray, but, you know, what happens when you go into the holy place? Have you got any stories, any tips? You know, he was probably very, very nervous doing this. 
Um, so he had hundreds of people praying outside the temple with him. He was yeah, very nervous, I would have thought, to be the chosen one almost that day, to be the one who went into the holiest holies, the holiest place inside the temple. What an amazing historical event to happen in your life. This would have been his big moment almost. And um, so he started praying um, before he went into the temple, probably praying for the classic things, you know, the restoration of Israel and God keep his own people. It's probably a very memorised prayer, a prayer that he'd probably written down and looked over, over and over and over uh, and memorised. Um, it's a very uh, symbolic event, so it's very formal. You know, he says his prayer, goes into the Holy Holies, lights it, comes out, says his prayer again. So that's how it worked, but it worked very differently this time. Um, so we go on to verse 11 to 17. He went to the temple. Remember, this is John the Baptist's dad. And started to pray. He probably had his eyes quite shut. Opened his eyes. An angel was there. An angel appeared when he opened his eyes. And this angel would have been a mighty, amazing figure. It would have been like awe-inspiring. And we know this because oft often the angel will say, don't be afraid. So if you see the angel, they're probably like, Whoa. the person's like really quite scared. The angels are saying, you know, the angel was saying, don't be afraid. So it's not this kind of, you know, baby with wings or, you know, romantic novel type angel. This would have been, you know, it would have filled people with awe and fear if you saw this angel. This was a, you know, pretty awe-inspiring experience. What does he say? Your prayers have been heard. So that is in verse... Uh, Do not be afraid if your prayers have been heard. Verse 13. And your wife Elizabeth will bear a son and you shall call his name John. So his prayer outside the temple probably wasn't a personal prayer to say, um, please bear me a son, because there would have been hundreds of people gathered. He would have been kind of dedicating the morning service to the Lord, probably praying about quite sort of bigger things, not necessarily personal issues. Um, but sometimes we pray for something for a long, long time. You know, we pray for the salvation of our child or our wife or husband or someone really close to us. We pray for a calling or a ministry. We pray that God will bring that special person to us. But after years of heartfelt prayer, we give up, don't we, sometimes out of discouragement. Zacharias and Elizabeth probably prayed years of passionate prayer for a son, but just gave up a long time ago and stopped believing God um, for so much anymore. So it, when he says, I, your prayers have been heard, I think that was him praying for a son with his wife for years and years and years. They got old now, so she can't conceive. She's too old to conceive at this point. Um, so when he says your prayers have been heard, I bet he's thinking, oh, you're going to restore Israel because that's the prayer I've just prayed. But no, this was a prayer that he would probably, a heartfelt prayer, have been praying for years. This is actually, you're going to actually have a son. You're going to be a dad. And he's thinking, I'm a bit old to be a dad, you know. <laughs> Um, it would have been an amazing experience and uh, so difficult to kind of conceptualise in our head this angel appearing and saying, look, your wife is going to have a child and that's, you know, at the age she is, is, is miraculous. So the angel said, you know, his wife was very son and called him John. He must have been thinking, you know, what? We're too old. He was probably in complete shock. Then the angel said that he would not drink any alcohol. Very strange to hear that. Why did he say that? Well, I think it's probably a reference to him being a Nazarite, um, it's it's almost it's a special oath that one would um, that one would take, and uh, you couldn't uh, eat or drink, you couldn't be around dead carcasses. Um, there were lots of different special kind of, um, I don't know, symbolic things you had to do to yourself to be a Nazarite, and it was it was basically like a special act of worship towards God, and some people would take it. But Gabriel says you're. Ju your John is going to have to be a Nazarite from birth. And that was actually quite rare. A Nazarite would usually pray when they're whatever age, 15, 20, 25, and just say, I'm going to be a Nazarite now for 28 days or two years or three years, just out of act of worship to you, God. You know, that's what they would say. But Gabriel was, you know, he was a Nazarite from birth. And they do things, yeah, like not be able to drink alcohol and not cut, that, cut their hair. So it probably turned out a lot like mine. Um, but yeah, they had special things to do. Um, and he would be a Nazarite because uh, he's special, John. And the angel said that he will be great and he will turn people's faces to the Lord. He will be filled with the Holy Spirit before birth. Go in the spirit of Elijah declaring the Lord's coming. I mean, what a feeling he must have had. Imagine being in that really nervous from taking that, taking that service, going into the Holy of Holies, 
ready to light a candle, you know, a quick prayer, come out, pray again. You know, all this is in his head. He just gets hit with this amazing surprise of an angel coming saying his wife's going to give birth. And not only is she going to give birth, um, but he would father a man that had the spirit of the one of, of the greatest prophets of all time in his nation, Israel, bringing back to their God. It would have just been incredible. So if we go on to 18 to 20. And Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I'm not for I'm an old man and my wife is advanced in years is old as well. Um, he responds in pretty much disbelief, he, which is fair enough. I mean, I would as well. He's basically saying, I'm old. You know, my wife can't conceive. How will I know? You know, very human response to what's just been said to you by an angel. Uh, it's a bit like, thanks for the promise, angel. But knowing the condition of my wife and I, this is a big one. You know, can you give us a sign to prove it? And the response he gets is almost, do you know who I am? You know, do, do you know where I sit? Do you know who's telling you this? You know, I'm, I'm Gabriel, who stands in the presence of the Lord himself. Is that not a sign enough? You know, it's a bit, it's a bit like that. Um, and Zacharias just didn't believe it. But he did pay the price for that by not being able to even speak until his son was born. So Zacharias prayed a part paid a bit of a price for his unbelief his unbelief did not make god take his promise back he didn't say oh if you don't believe it you're not having the son no he didn't take his promise back because it was a promise it just kept zacharias from actually enjoying it you know when when we do not believe god's promises for our lives we we don't necessarily destroy the promise but we do destroy our ability sometimes to enjoy the promise what made this such a severe punishment was that zachariah had such great news to tell but he couldn't tell it he couldn't speak it's an incredible news. Imagine praying with your wife for years and years and years about having a child, not being able to do it, be a bit disappointed, or very disappointed, and then coming back to your wife and being able to say, you're going to be pregnant, we're going to, you know, you're, we're going to conceive, we're going to have a child. He couldn't say that. He was, he was mute. So it sort of destroyed a bit of the joy because he didn't believe. And strangely, many Christians would not consider this a punishment. They don't mind keeping quiet about the good news of Jesus. And we should never be like that. So uh, that is a punishment, not to be able to speak of what the Lord has done in your life. So always speak of it, because as we know, God can take that away from us at any point, just as he did with Zechariah. So verse 21 to 23, some people were struck dead in the temple. So when they went in, sometimes the holiest, holiest of holiest, holy of holies, um, I heard someone say that actually sometimes they'd actually tie a rope around the priests that went in just in case they died they didn't have to come into the temple so they could pull out the dead body in case he died so it was known that people were struck dead sometimes in the temple and Zacharias was taking a rather long time to come out as well so the crowd of hundreds are probably like oh what's happened you know they're getting a bit nervous but when Zacharias did, Zacharias did come out he was supposed to stand on the temple steps overlooking the crowd and pronounce the priestly blessing on the people which is from Numbers 6 24 and the other priest would repeat it after him. But Zacharias, of course, couldn't speak. So he, he couldn't say this priestly prayer. Doing the best he could through, I reckon, like through hand motions and stuff. He told the story of what happened to him in the temple. But it's hard to know if everyone actually believed that. You know, he might have just got very nervous and just said, oh, I don't want to say the prayer and, and gone. So it must have been quite a socially awkward event coming out of that temple and being mute in front of hundreds of people when you're expected to give a prayer. <laughs> Um, so yeah, it's it's a really interesting account of what happened, um, and we'll do the very last bit, twenty four to twenty five. She did conceive, so it, it, God came through on the promise, like He always does. She did conceive, and then went to pray alone with God for a while, as this was a real, real miracle. So yeah, like I said at the beginning, I didn't really, um, I haven't really studied this in great depth, and it's an amazing story because it's almost like God's. Um, miracle of sending Jesus his own son into the world it was so amazing that he even made a miracle for the person just telling them about Jesus the dad of that person so it's just amazing um, and now we'll just move on uh, to the birth of Jesus foretold so that's verses 26 to 38 so now Gabriel turns up again so we're coming out now at that time um, and in the sixth month the angel Gabriel was sent from God to a city of Galilee named Nazareth. Now, Nazareth had never been mentioned before. Nazareth was a proper nowhere sort of town, a town that you just don't hear about. And uh, this is the first time it was mentioned. 
To a virgin betrothed to a man whose name was Joseph of the house of David, and the virgin's name was Mary. So he, Gabriel turns up again, and do you see that God is using his angels to start preparing the way of God to come down in human flesh? This is a miraculous event. This is almost like the pre-earthquakes going on that we can see. A miraculous birth. John the Baptist coming. Mary being told by Gabriel. All these things are like, this is about to be something big. The biggest event in human history is about to come about. And I love how Luke describes all of the kind of precursors to Jesus' birth. As Luke is saying exactly what that is. Luke is saying that this is supernatural. This is going to be amazing. So yeah, Gabriel turns up again. Um, Gabriel then visited Mary. Mary was betrothed. So you would get um, kind of promised to each other by the two fathers um, when you're young. So two fathers would come together and say, yes, my daughter will marry your son. That's how it's going to be. And then you'd be betrothed, which is a bit like a wedding ceremony. Not a wedding, just the ceremony. So she was in that kind of middle ground. And then the marriage would come and the groom would just turn up unannounced and just, just take, it, take his wife. So this was kind of between those two moments. So she was a virgin still. Mary was betrothed. So she made a formal marriage vows to Joseph, but they were not married. So she was a virgin. But this is so important because it's been lost a lot now um, in the church at large that Mary was not a virgin. And that is absolutely untrue. What we can see clearly from scripture, and we trust scripture over what man says, because we know how often man is wrong. And scripture is an anvil that has worn out many, many hammers. People have tried to destroy it. People have tried to disprove it. But it has not happened. And there's an extremely important reason why she had to be a virgin. All of humanity had been conceived from Adam. Okay? It was sinful. That means every child ever born is born into sin. The reason why Jesus was born from a virgin and not man is that that disease, if you like, that passed down the curse of sin did not touch Jesus. He was born from above. He was born without the curse of sin. This is why the virgin birth is so important. Because theologically, if he had been conceived in the normal way, he would have had that same curse as all we do, which is the ability to inevitably sin. We all sin. We are all born into sin because of the curse that was passed down from Adam to his son, 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 to our dad, who then conceived in the normal way and made us with sin. That's just how human nature is. That's what we call human nature. So she, she had to be a virgin because it kind of goes under the radar of that sin, that conce that conception sin. It's born. He is born from God himself. So it's so important. I really wanted to major on that because it is so important that you do believe that Mary was a virgin and Jesus was put there by the Holy Spirit, not by Joseph, not by normal, natural means. So we all have the ability to inevitably sin, but Jesus does not have that because he was born of a virgin. Okay, let's get, let's get that out of the way. So Gabriel says that uh, she will have a son. Call him Jesus. And what will he do? So verse 32, he will be the son of the Most High. Imagine hearing that. He will be God's son. Remember that if he was born naturally, this would make no sense, as Joseph would be his dad, wouldn't he? His dad was God himself. The Lord will give Jesus the throne that David prophesied as well. So we've got prophecy, we've got supernatural occurrences, we've got God being his dad. Verse 33, his kingdom will have no end. He will reign over God's elect people forever. So you're Mary, probably a 14, 13, 15 year old girl, you're hearing that you will suddenly become pregnant and the baby will be God's only son. He'll be called Emmanuel, which literally means God in the flesh, who will live forever. How would you how would you feel about that? I mean, you, it's, it's disbelief, isn't it, really? But if you if Gabriel was there and an angel was there and he told you, no, don't be afraid because I can see you're afraid because of the way I look and the way I am and who I am, you'd you would it, it's not just some bloke turning up saying are oh, you gonna you know, you're gonna be pregnant it's gonna be from god and it wasn't like that because you just disbelieve it straight away this was an angel telling her so she was she must have just been so shocked and she responded in a very human way how can i get pregnant i'm a virgin that doesn't work 
But Gabriel answered, it's supernatural, Mary. God will put a child in your belly. He will do it. This isn't a natural conception. This is a miracle. So you sort of just have to believe it. Mary responds amazingly well to this in absolute trust and faith. And we should come to amazing miracles like a child, shouldn't we? Exactly like Mary did and was. She accepted that this would be the case and she was comfortable with it. Gabriel also to told Mary as well, in fact, that Elizabeth, her relative, her old relative, also had a son. Nothing is impossible with God, he says at the end, which is absolutely fantastic. Nothing is impossible with God. Gabriel was saying, look, Mary, it doesn't matter what you think and what your physical representation is of this earth and the laws of physics and all that. Doesn't mean anything to me. I'm, I'm God. I'm sent from God. This is what God has said. Therefore, this is what he will do. It's a very matter of fact. Gabriel is doing what John the Baptist would do and pointing God's servants to the fact that God does not work within the natural realm. And to summarise for us, God does not work in the natural realm. He uses the natural realm, but he works in the supernatural realm. So God, the things that happen in your life, even though they may look natural, if God is in it, if you're a Christian, if you have the Holy Spirit in you, they will be supernatural. God is pulling the strings behind the scenes in the supernatural realm. The things that happen to you when you're trying to witness to someone, for example, if you if you go through something um, and you start, and you serve God, you will have opposition from the supernatural realm as well. Satan works there too. So Satan will also be there in the supernatural realm, causing things to happen in the physical. And this is what's happening in this account. God is there in the supernatural realm, causing things to happen in the physical realm, such as Elizabeth getting pregnant, Mary getting pregnant without having sex before. These are all natural things that happen in the supernatural realm. Therefore, they're outside the laws of physics. They're outside the natural. And it's very important. So, yeah, I think we'll probably stop there for the uh, first uh, Luke's gospel. And we'll go on to Mary visiting Elizabeth, uh, Mary's song of praise and the birth of John the Baptist and Zechariah's prophecy as well. So there's a lot to get. There's 80 verses in Luke 1. So I think I thought it'd be too long of a video to do all of the 80 verses. But I hope you learned a bit from this. I hope um, you're excited to go on to the next bit, to Luke 2, to Luke 3, to start learning more about Jesus's life. But um, just as you wait for the next one to come out, if you've seen this now, before the next one comes out, then uh, please read it. Please read it for yourself. Look at some commentaries and um, just delve deeper into this amazing prophecy. Um, we all know quite a lot about the um, birth of Jesus being foretold with Mary because it's part of the whole Bethlehem story with nativity and at school and that kind of thing. But the, just a few verses before that, the birth of John the Baptist foretold is also absolutely incredible as well. So just look into the history of that um, and try and read it for yourselves. So thank you very much. Um, hopefully, I haven't found a video yet, but if there was a video before this, then I found it. So I'm just recording this just as soon as I finished... Um, writing the notes for it because uh, it was amazing I, I had to get it out because uh, it's fresh in my mind but hopefully I'll find videos as well because for the previous John videos there was a really good YouTube series which documented the whole of John in video format I'm hoping to find that as well for Luke um, if not then I'll try and find something else to fill up me talking for 40 minutes because um, it could get pretty frustrating but thank you very much guys I'll see you in a couple of weeks time and um, share God's word with you have a blessed week and uh, keep on keeping on.